All right, so tonight I'm really excited to introduce uh, our speakers. They're from Northeast Passage up in Nashua, New Hampshire. David Lee is the Assistant Director of Northeast Passage. He does the planning and coordinating and implementing the sports and recreation events for individuals with physical disabilities. He's been with Northeast Passage since 1999 and created the organization, the organization's school-based therapeutic recreation program for children with disabilities that modifies activities and experiences to meet the IEP goals and objectives. David specializes in adaptive equipment, adaptive cycling, water skiing, out and outdoor access, and he has a master's in therapeutic recreation from the University of New Hampshire. And with him this evening is Chandler Bullard. Chandler is the program specialist up at Northeast Passage. He's a native of New Hampshire, an advocate for diversity awareness. He acquired his spinal cord injury in 1993 as a teenager. He's currently working with Northeast Passage where he runs and presents Similarity Awareness Program, teaching school-aged children that we are all more similar than different with or without a disability. He, he also coaches, coaches the Northeast Passage Quad Rugby team. So I'm gonna turn it over to them. Thanks. <clears throat> Can every, am I on the speaker? Good, all right, nice. Um, so, my name is Chandler Bullard. Um, throughout this, uh, time for questions will be at the end. What we're going to do is we're going to bring up equipment, we're going to put it up here, we're going to go through the slides uh, and show you kind of what we do for adaptive equipment. Uh, everything from court sports to hiking, cycling, um, a few water sports and other things. And then we'll have uh, questions and then at the end you can come up and look at the equipment um, and see what might work for you or for a friend. Um, a patient, uh, what have you. So, uh, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and stuff like that. It looks like the presentation will go about 45 minutes and then plenty of time afterwards. Uh, so, Northeast Passage. Uh, Claudine said, uh, Nashua, we're actually out of UNH. It's Durham, New Hampshire. We are affiliated with UNH, um, so they kind of help keep the lights on. Uh, but we are our own organization, a nonprofit that does therapeutic recreation. We do adaptive sports. Uh, we do uh, anything adaptive recreation. Uh, you name it, you come to us, you want to try something, we are going to figure out a way to do it. Um, we figured out how to make hiking, turn it into a, uh, from an individual sport to a team sport or a team activity. Uh, we've, you know, water skiing, golf. Uh, we have plenty of programming during the summer and winter months. And then we have our sports programming, which includes power soccer, quad rugby, alpine and Nordic skiing, and sled hockey. We have some of that equipment here, um, power soccer as well, sorry. Um, and I'll explain all those sports when we come up uh, and with our court sport uh, when those uh, equipment comes up here. Uh, and then we have our school-based programming where we uh, go into schools and work with people with cognitive disabilities, physical disabilities, help them out in the community or assist them in the community. Uh, but what we're here to talk about is strictly recreation. What you do when you want to leave here. Uh, what, what was something that you did maybe possibly before your accident? Maybe something that you want to try that's new? Uh, before my accident, I was injured when I was 15 years old. I, was, I played three contact sports, football, hockey, and lacrosse. So when I went into the adaptive world, I had to do something obviously slightly different. I picked tennis, um, track work, uh, road work um, out of one of those bikes, uh, out of one of those uh, wheelchairs. I realized I wanted my shoulders, so I stopped doing the track work. Uh, but I just had to adapt. I did different things. Uh, but uh, wheelchair tennis became my love. I actually liked it more than uh, stand-up tennis. Probably because it was awful when I did stand-up tennis. But uh, wheelchair tennis was my thing. Uh, so we'll start here with our court chair. I want to grab our court chair. That's a nice one right there. That is a basketball chair. Um, who here has seen basketball, wheelchair basketball? It is, uh, if you, it is mainly for paraplegics and uh, uh, amputees, um, seeing how we're mainly talking about SCI. Um, pairs like myself, T5s, there's a point structure to it um, to play. I'm a T5, I would be rated as a 1. Uh, a person that's a T12 is rated as a 2, and usually amps, amputees, are rated as a 3. You can only have 12, was it 15 points on the court? I always forget. 12 or 15 points on the court at any given time. Uh, 12 points. Uh, Anyway, that's just a little tidbit about basketball. But that chair is about a high pointer chair. Uh, these court chairs can be used for anything. Um, what we use them for is, what I use them for when I go to programming, is anything from capture the flag, tag games, to 
playing handball wheelchair, handball wheelchair, rugby wheelchair, basketball. These chairs can pretty much do anything. The reason why uh, we use these chairs and not your everyday chair is even though my chair, as you can see my chair, I'm just not going to touch it. <laughs> my chair looks awesome. Yes, it does. You're right. Uh, it's tiny. It's a haul. It looks like it would be super fast. It would feel like a tank compared to this chair. Just because of the angle of the wheels, the smaller wheels in the front, the wheel in the back, I would never play in this chair in wheelchair basketball, especially if I was playing against other uh, Paralympians or other people that use chairs, I would get smoked. It would be like, even if LeBron James went on the court, he would be nothing if he didn't have good sneakers on, something like that. If he wore boots, he'd be horrible. That's the, that's the analogy I use. If you put big boots on someone, they're not going to be able to play basketball. It's the same thing in this. You want some chair that can move um, on the court well. And the reason for that can move is the camber and the wheels. See how they're angled out? In all wheelchair sports, you're going to have some camber, some a little bit more severe than others. When you get to tennis, the angle is incredibly severe because um, you want to spin as fast as you can. Here, you want to have some control. You don't want to have to be able to tap the wheel and spin out of control. Uh, basketball chairs usually now have two wheels in the back. This one has a single wheel in the back. Uh, you have a bar in the front that protects the chair and yourself. In all, in all sports, there is contact, just like stand-up sports. You're running around a soccer field, you're going to bump into somebody. Wheelchair sports is the same thing. You're going to run into uh, people, bump into each other, um, either, either causing a foul or it's just incidental contact. So you have the bar in the front. The wheel in the back helps you from tipping over backwards. Can you still tip over backwards in wheelchair sports? Yes. And it happens all the time. And it's one of my favorite things to watch. Um, happens more in quad rugby, but in basketball, it happens all the time. Going up for a ball, spin, get, lose your balance, pop right out. Um, but in most wheelchair sports, you're strapped in really heavy. So you go down in the chair, someone comes out and just lifts you right back up into it. Uh, so this chair, uh, you can also use this chair for wheelchair tennis. Um, do we have the tennis picture? Uh, or is that the next tennis one? Tennis in here? Um, as you can see from... Oh, we're Can't go to tennis yet. We're... Okay, yeah. There we go. There we go. Tennis. We'll as, jump around a little bit. Yeah. As you can see in tennis, uh, the wheels are more angled. So the front wheels, your casters, are more towards the, uh, the back wheels itself. That way it's more movability and it's real, uh, real uh, uh, stable. Uh, my wheelchair tennis chair is old school and it only has one wheel in the front and I tip hard in that sometimes. Uh, but it's the same principle. You have the wheel in the back so you don't tip over backwards. Wheels in the front to keep you stable and you can see the severe, almost the severe angle of the uh, camber in the wheels uh, for tennis. Uh, but you can use this chair. A lot of people buy one of these and use it for everything. Um, you can't use these for everyday use. The reason you can't use them for everyday use is the wheels. You just can't get through doorways. I mean, most doorways are going to be able to get into elevators become a problem. Bathrooms are almost impossible. Even in and out of car, say you're a paraplegic, in and out of car gets a little bit more difficult taking the wheels off. So it's just like buying another pair of sneakers except for that they're slightly more expensive. Um, and uh, so you just have different chairs for different sports. But this chair can pretty much do anything that you're going to do on a court, tennis court or a basketball court. Um, so I think we're good there. What's that? Yeah. Okay. Um, Hello? There we go. Oh. Um, a couple things I want to say. Uh, Taylor mentioned the camber a little bit. Um, the other big thing about the camber is stability. Okay? If you think of that Pontiac commercial a few years ago, wider is better, gives you a wider footprint. You're playing uh, wheelchair sports, you're reaching for a basketball coming off to your side. You reach out there, you don't want to tip over. So that, that camber is, is spreading your footprint out um, so you have more stability. Everyday chair doesn't have that camber, but you're not reaching out to you know, catch a football flying by you. Um, also protects your hands too yep. when in contact. Exactly. So Chandler just said when, when you get two chairs together and you're pushing hard down a court, if your wheels were vertically straight up and down, your hands would come into contact with the other person's hands. You'd squish fingers, break fingers, be a bad scenario. When they have the camber like this, um, the bottom of the wheels hit, but the, the tops of the wheels are you know, six inches apart, 10 inches apart, depending on the camber. Um, another thing to look at is, if you look at this picture of the tennis chair, um, you see where the girl's feet are. My analogy for this is always a figure skater. If you think of watching a figure skater on ice, when they spin, when their arms are out wide, they spin slow. Okay? When, you bring your, when they bring their arms in, they spin really fast. 
Same thing with the wheelchairs. If you can bring your feet up under you, it's bringing that center, your center of axis in a, in a tighter line, you can spin much faster. So if Chandler sticks his feet out in front and turns around, it's going to take a lot more effort than if he pulls his feet in underneath his, underneath his seat. Um, so you'll see in tennis, you want to be super maneuverable. You've got to turn around really quick to get to the ball coming the other way. They bring their feet up under them so they can turn really fast. It's hard to go fast in a straight line when you do this, but maneuverability is, is more important in tennis. King in tennis. <clears throat> yeah, and if you have questions about tennis, I can talk more about this afterwards. Uh, if someone is interested in wheelchair tennis, there's a lot of principles to it that are amazing. Uh, you know, call them figure eight, you do reverse turns away from the ball, all things that you're taught not to do in stand-up sports you have to do in a lot of wheelchair sports. A lot of things to get more advantage on the court and make more space for yourself. Um, and another reason to tuck the, uh, your, your legs under is to get rid of your knees. Uh, a lot of times when you come and do a forehand, you come right across your knees, so you want to get them as far down below. Uh, and it all depends on your balance. You know, if, if someone's a T5 like myself, we've got to really strap in and uh, make it so uh, when I do that forehand, I can get my arm out, things like that. So a lot of strapping, <laughs> and now my favorite. So strapping is one big thing. We'll talk about that, too, a little bit later. Uh, being one with the chair is very important. You're not going to buy size 13 shoes when you're size 9. It's the same principle of chairs. This is a rugby chair. Um, as you can see here, these guys are actually, those are high pointer chairs. I brought a low pointer chair with me. Uh, who here has heard of quad rugby or tried quad rugby? Uh, it's a very, it used to be called murder ball, invented in, uh, by Canadians. Um, they have nothing better to do uh, in their sports, so they, you know, they got cold in the winter. They invented this great sport. It's a phenomenal sport. Um, it's played on a basketball court. As you'll notice with most wheelchair sports, they're done on a basketball court. So power soccer, obviously wheelchair basketball, and quad rugby. In power soccer, I bet you in an ideal world, and in rugby, we'd want to be, have a bigger court. But as we all know, basketball courts are everywhere. So anytime we want to have a tournament or anything, we do that. So most rules and stuff like that are based upon uh, basketball lines. Uh, so this is a high pointer chair. They are basically your defensive players. So you have a picker in the front. This picks the wheels. You can still see the camber that you have, a very severe camber. On the side, the wheels, all of them are uh, different on what you want. It's full contact sport. It's the only wheelchair sport that is full contact. You get slammed around. Uh, it's, you can see this chair is beat all the heck. But uh, you have the wheels, so it protects the spokes right here. Small front wheels, two wheels in the back, as close as they can get to the uh, mid wheels. That way to help from tipping over. In any game, there will probably be two or three times someone does spill out and tip over. It's high speed. It's not going anywhere. Um, high speed. It's high contact, uh, and uh, it's it's a phenomenal sport. Uh, you should, if you're interested in it, you can talk to me about it. We have a team up at UNH that practices for eight months of the year, um, every Saturday, and we also uh, go to tournaments throughout those eight months. Uh, so if you have questions about that, we can do that. But as I said, this is a high pointer chair, so someone that's, I mean, low pointer chair, so someone that's uh, C5, C6. This is their chair that they use. They're defensive. Uh, someone that is uh, a high level C7, C8, uh, or has a high pointer chair, um, and that one would have wings on the side, just like you see right here, where Dave is. And that is because they're offensive chair, so they want to protect themselves from getting picked by these pickers in the front. Uh, these uh, chairs range in cost, but you always have to buy another set of wheels. This chair, for example, uh, with the extra wheels, it was 5,500, I believe. Um, they're all custom made. I always suggest custom made. We have chairs at Northeast Pass that you do try and get close enough to fitting. But like I was saying before, you want the chair to be one with you, so you get a chair fitted to you in all types of dimensions. How much bucket you want, how much balance you need. Every one is specific. If you need more balance, you want more bucket. Uh, if you, you know, longer, taller, you have to have, you know, it's a, just a different uh, where the aspects of the chair change and bigger, smaller. You want it to have the smallest chair as possible, just like in any equipment you're having uh, for any sport. Is our low pointer chair. That's pretty sweet. Feet up. I love them. Um, cool. And you can see some of them come with straps. Uh, like a, uh, something you would do see in a ski boot. Some people like that, uh, some people don't. It's all uh, preference. So next slide. Oh, 
bad boys. My old tromping ground. This is, yeah, this, these chairs. Now, this is an old hall. This one, what do you think that weighs, six pounds? Something like that. The now chairs, the racing chairs are three to five, four pounds. They're all carbon fiber. It's unbelievable how light they are. It's, 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 you want as light as possible. You can see these as used in the Boston Marathon. Those guys are flying. You can see how far, how fast they go and do 26.2. Uh, you can do this in track and field. This is also a great cardio workout when you're doing on the road. Uh, it is, you are lower and it is hard to see. I always recommend people when they're first starting out doing it, do it on track. Uh, everyone, um, this is, you know, a paraplegic sport quad, uh, and an amputee sport mainly. Uh, there are a bunch of quads that I have friends that there's a quad division that do really well uh, in it. I got beat by some quads when I first started. Um, beat me good. Um, actually, Adam Ellis. Uh, so he's one of our quad rugby players now too. As you can see, your push rim is right down here because you are not holding on to uh, the chair. So you're not, when you have a push rim right here, you're holding on, you push, you release, things like that. This is, there's different terminology and stuff like that for doing it. But way back when I did it, you wore a harness glove and it's basically just a rubber tire and you strap it down and your fingers don't move and you slam it from 10 to two and you rotate like this. So you never grab it, so it's all constant motion. Um, going around, as you can see by the aggressiveness of the of the hitting of the of the ring, it, it does work on your wrists, elbows, and shoulders quite a deal. So you'll see a lot, and and Dave will talk about the hand cycles. But you see a lot of athletes that love this because it's incredibly competitive, and it's amazing. But you tear those those muscles and those those shoulders, wrists, and elbows, and they switch over to hand cycling, which is a more natural movement. Uh, but again, this is something that I guess you would say is, you know, one of the cooler. It's it's in every marathon. It's in it's it's a very cool sport, and these guys fly. They are motors. Uh, but now nowadays, they're even some of the best racers only have tiny rubber that they hold onto their two fingers like this and just slam like that. I don't really know how they do it. It's different from when I was. But as you can see, everyone is different. Every chair is different, and these have to be. It's very hard to rent these out because they have to almost fit you perfectly. Um, these are the type of chairs that you want to be fitted in um, to, uh, to perfection, pretty much. But it's a fun chair. Um, I always suggest people to try it out, but hand cycling is more the, the speed that I like. And also, turning, I guess, in the <laughs> it's very difficult to turn these um, in, the, in the sense of because you're always pushing. Um, a lot of guys do hop moves, so when they, if they have hips and stuff like that moving it, but you have these, this turns it right in the front, and you also have, um, I always forget the turn Track wrong. bar. What's that? Track bar. Yeah, where if you're on a track and you hit the turn, you hit it, and it actually motors you around perfectly on the track if you have it set right. I never had mine set right. I always had it skip, but uh, very fun. A little dangerous, but fun. Um, no courts again. Yeah, and that was just uh, what we were talking about. Um, we started with a basketball chair, which is more designed to be more higher up than the one we showed. This is an all-court wheelchair. That's the ones we carry for our sports, and that's the one I more recommend for people that are just starting out and want to try something. They go to their local Y. They go, you know, even in, you know, if they have a tennis court they want to go try out. This chair will get you moving and, and faster uh, and, and safer than your everyday chair. Uh, I would suggest the all-court first. Yeah. Give me one second while I throw this on. All right, hear me? chair. Um, we've done a bunch of hiking in it, uh, Northeast Passage, uh, up in the White Mountains. It's something that a lot of people want to get back to, get back out into that wilderness area. And, you know, whether it be just campgrounds, nature trails, 
things like that, or if they want to go up into the mountains themselves. So this is a, a hiking chair made by Motion Concepts. It's called the Terra Trek. You notice the, the biggest things about it right away are the wheels. Uh, large front casters, they want to roll over things as opposed to the little front casters on most everyday chairs. Come up to a route, things like that off-road, you're going to go right over onto your nose. Um, so these large 12-inch casters, not fun to go fast in, but they're going to allow you to access you know, unpaved terrain much better than the smaller wheels. Also, the uh, large mountain bike tires in the back give you a little bit more traction, a little bit more push when you're on that looser terrain, a little more flotation. Um, besides that, it's a wheelchair. You know, you can kind of get around on roads with it, um, into, you know, around parking lots, things like that. You can go on roads with them a little bit. A lot of people will use them in the winter time when it, there's snow, um, things like that. But we've also changed them a little bit. So these two pictures here show some of the modifications that we've done to a couple of our chairs, really to get in the off-road environment. Um, it's really hard to go up hills and over rocks and things like that. So we've added on a couple rickshaw poles. And the way we work with the rickshaw poles is we'll actually take the front casters off. Even though they're big, they still don't want to go over you know, foot tall rocks. Um, they don't want to go over logs, things like that. When we take those wheels off, we use the rickshaw poles. We have two people that hold on to the front of those rickshaw poles. We have one person on the back. Uh, kind of hard to see behind this lower picture here, has a big handle in the back. Um, that's our safety person. They keep that chair on the ground um, and upright. So when we're going over one of those large rocks, over the log, things like that, that person in the back is really maintaining the balance of that chair for the person. So when we hike, we call it hiking as a team. Uh, typically there are four people in the team, two people up front, the person in the chair um, who is the director of the team, and the person in back who is our safety person. Uh, but with, our, with this setup, we've been um, to the top of some of the White Mountains, Mount Lafayette, Mount, um, Galehead Mountain. We've been to four of the six huts up on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, we've gone all over. Uh, we do a lot of school hikes with kids, um, and this is the device we use. It works out really, really well. Um, but it is a lot of work. <laughs> um, and we've also modified some of the chairs to have more support than just the standard backrest, lateral supports, head headrests, things like that. Um, as for companies that make these, there are very few. Um, this one is kind of the primary hiking chair that's out there. There are a couple, con a couple companies that make um, what they call all-terrain chairs. Um, I have a picture of one. Might be next. It might not be. Um, Colors makes one. Big fat wheels on it. It's really heavy, but it will roll across really loose ground. Um, and Top End also has an all-terrain chair out there. Big three-inch knobby tires on it. Larger front casters. If you notice, some of these are lighter than other ones. So this is a picture of that, um, the colors tremor that I mentioned. Uh, larger wheels on it. Um, they're big, like four-inch balloon tires. It's designed for kind of that all-terrain use. Beach access, um, campgrounds, things like that. It's not really a hiking chair, but you know, it really depends on what you mean by hiking. So uh, that's one of the options there. The beach chair next. Um, another hiking device is the what we what's called a trail rider. It's made by a company out in British Columbia. Um, it's a one-wheel rickshaw device. So you have rickshaw on the front, rickshaw on the back. The person that sits in the chair um, is along for the ride. Um, and some people really like that, and they like to be escorted around like they're you know the king or the queen. Um, a lot of people just don't feel like they're part of the team because they can't help out. There's no way for them to you know, assist over a rock or things like that. So they kind of feel like, yeah, this is great and all, but 
I want to be doing more. I want to help out however I can. Um, but for the, for the right person, um, we have we use this device actually for with a lot of kids um, because kids aren't really eager to push themselves up a mountain, um, so they rely on us to do that. Um, but it works out really well for the right people. Um, but we wanted to include that in there because, uh, like I said, for the right person, it's a great device because there's only one wheel under it. You can track around ob obstacles much easier than you can when you're using a wheelchair with two wheels. Thank you. Beach chairs. There are a couple beach chairs out there. This is our favorite. Um, it's called a Hippocamp. Uh, it's made by Vipamat Technologies, or a, a French company. Um, the really nice part about this chair, it has two wheels on the back on each side. Um, kind of hard to see, but we'll be able to look at these later. Those two wheels actually create a little valley between the wheels, and it acts like a snowshoe. Okay, So if you think of that on sand, the sand can't, sand can't go through the two wheels. So it kind of creates that little snowshoe effect, and it floats on the sand better than a single wheel would, um, and even sometimes more than a... Um, a larger wheel would. Has a front balloon tire on the front. There's very little weight on the front wheel. So it does not swivel. You don't need it to. It's very easy to move that wheel on the sand um, because there's so much weight centered over the back of the chair. This chair also has armrests and a headrest. But more importantly on the back, it has a big, large push handle. So you can get some assistance. I don't care where you go and what the sand is like, most people want a little assistance on the sand. Um, but the nicest part about this beach chair is water access. Typically when you go to the beach, you want to go in the water. Um, you can push this chair independently, which is nice. You can push it right into the water. And instead of floating, this chair kind of sinks. It'll float to about the height of the, the wheels. So the, the balloon tire will float up front, the rear tires will float, and they'll just be exposed at the top. So it kind of floats like a pool lounge chair. Really nice feature. So you can sit in the chair and just kind of float and kind of hang out in the water. Or you can paddle yourself out a little ways, take the chair by the armrests, or if it doesn't have armrests on it, by the wheels, push it down and out of the way, and you can float off and swim. So that's a really nice feature um, that this chair will do. It's the only beach chair that I know of um, that will allow you to do that. It's all aluminum. There's no steel parts on it. Um, it won't rust. It will corrode with salt water. So you still need to wash them off. But a really nice option for beachgoers. There are a couple other beach chairs out there. The more popular kinds that people will see. A lot of state parks will have these. Um, kind of an eyesore in my opinion, and a lot of people feel that same way. Big, <laughs> big balloon tires on them. Um, they roll across sand better than anything else, but you are completely dependent in these chairs. Um, also, they do not like to go in the water. Because those balloon tires are, have so much air in them, you get into about six inches of water, and that chair wants to flip over. You want to go in the water, what's your choice? Transfer off the chair into the sand, drag yourself through the sand in the shallow water into the water. Not so bad getting in, because you got the water to wash yourself off, right? Getting out, we have a, one of our uh, consumers describes himself as a sanded shrimp when he decides to get out of the water and use a chair like this, because you have to drag yourself through the sand, you're soaking wet, you get back in the chair, and you're covered with sand. So, but they're out there for the right people. They work really well for people that aren't interested in going into the water um, or just want to get out onto the beach. They work great. Um, so a couple other options. Alpine skiing. Um, mono skis and bi skis. One ski, two skis. Very self-explanatory there. Um, 
the one in the middle is actually called a dual ski. Uh, the skis actually have a natural skiing movement to them, uh, which is kind of nice. It's a, it's a fairly new product out in the last few years. Um, we don't do all that much alpine skiing. I didn't bring an alpine skiing a ski because Northeast Passage does not do alpine skiing. We'll send you to Loon Mountain. We'll send you to Sunapee. We'll send you to one of the local ski areas that have a ski program. They're the experts. Go to them. Okay. But they are out there. Um, and there's a lot of publicity around them with X Games and Paralympics and, and things like that. And it's a popular winter sport. A lot of people in the Northeast go skiing. Um, so we want to show you those. Nordic skiing. Um, this is the skiing that we do in the winter time. Um, this is a Nordic ski frame, pair of cross country skis. Nordic skiing, cross country skiing, basic, same thing. Um, pretty demanding adaptive sport. You get two poles, you sit on the frame, and you push. All arms. Um, Hopefully there's tracks because those skis are fixed. They do not like to turn. However, if you're in a tracked uh, cross-country ski place, um, when you're going in those tracks, they'll pretty much steer you where you need to go. Hills, they're interesting. Um, very difficult to go up because when you go up, you want to slide back down. Um, some skis that we use do have scales on them. That helps a little bit with going up hills. Um, most of the skis that we use are what they refer to as skate skis. Um, they are not scaled on the bottom, so they really want to slide backwards on you when you're going up a hill. Downhill, there are no brakes on these. So you have to figure out how to slow yourself down. And usually on a downhill, there are no tracks. So you need to figure out how to steer yourself. There are two ways you can do this. You have your poles. Hopefully your hands hit the snow. You can take your poles and drag the hand, your hands in the snow and take the, the tips of the poles, drag them. That will help slow you down. Drag the right side. It will help steer you to the right. Left will steer you to the left. Um, some people will even take the poles, stick them under their arms, and lean back. Drag the baskets of the, ski, the poles. That will also help slow you down. Um, or crash. Or tip over, crash. That's, that's um, it, it, it's a great way to access the woods in the winter time. It is demanding, yes, but to really get out there in the snow, to get out in the woods, really nice and quiet and peaceful in the woods in the winter time, um, it's a really nice option. We have a lot of people that use the snowshoe, still want to get out there. Family friends will snowshoe. They can use one of these skis. And when you have nice friends that are snowshoeing, we will take, here's a little trick, an apple corer. You know what apple corers are? A little metal thing that's got all slices an apple when you push down in it. You can attach one of those to the back of this. That way when you take your sharp pole and you stick it into the back, it hits the apple corer and stops. Otherwise, you're sticking right through the upholstery and you're going to skewer someone in the back. Um, but that apple corer, you can come up alongside, stick it into the apple corer, give them a boost up the hill. Okay, Nice little trick. Makes that experience a lot more fun for a lot of people. A uh, couple manufacturers out there. Uh, this is a Kiwi um, cross-country ski frame. Sierra's um, made up in Washington, I believe. There are a couple out there. Pretty custom, though, um, depending on person size and really what they want to do with the, the cross-country ski. Water ski. <laughs> We're going to bounce around the seasons. <clears throat> All right, water skiing. Um, water skiing is my passion in the summer. So I love this program. Uh, this is a beginner water ski. Um, 
the coolest thing about water skiing, in my opinion, having done both stand up and sit down, is it feels the same. You're just in a different position. So when you're standing up skiing, you're crossing the wakes, all the same motions and movements you do standing up, you do sitting down. Okay? So this cage look like, looks like it's on backwards, um, but that's actually there, higher part in the front to kind of stabilize your knees. Feet go under the foot plate here. Um, it is adjustable forward and back depending on how tall people are. And those cages are also different sizes depending on the size of people. The beginner water skis also have what we call our block. It's a basically a piece of plastic with a, um, a cutout in it. And if people don't have the hand strength to get out of the water themselves, you can run the rope through this block and the boat will pull the ski out of the water. So it's kind of like riding a sled to get up. You still need to balance it. Um, but once you get it out of the water, there's a lot less strain on that rope than trying to get out of the water because um, it's gliding across the top. So people with very limited hand strength can actually reach down, grab the rope with their wrists, their fingers, their wrists, whatever they've got. If they can grab something, um, they can grab that rope, pull it out of the block, and then ski with it, um, hold it on themselves. Okay? You don't need that hand strength to get out of the water. As you progress into the intermediate and advanced skis, you do need that hand strength. There is, there is no block on them. Um, but ski around the top is using a beginner ski. Um, freedom. It's awesome to be behind a boat, no one else around you, and you're in control of where you want to go and how to get there. You can go across those wakes as fast as you want. You can get air. Um, we also have a wakeboard that we've uh, modified to, with a cage on it. A lot of fun. You can do tricks. You can do 360s on them. Lots of, lots of possibilities. Um, the company that's making them here in the States right now is based out of Florida, um, Liquid Access. Uh, good company. Skis work really well. They're, the other two companies are based out of Australia, I believe. A um, little, little bit harder to get their equipment. Yeah. Um, I think with uh, water skiing, it's the one sport where it feels just like the stand-up version for me, anyway. Same with alpine skiing. Uh, if you've never done it, then you do it. It's almost like the stand-up version too. Um, with your your quad or para, it still feels getting up on and the freedom. But like Dave explained, what is incredible. And when I did, I did a lot more when I was out in San Diego. I don't do so much here. I should because we're pretty awesome at it actually. <laughs> with these passengers and what Dave has created for our water ski program is pretty amazing. Um, the safety. A lot of people will talk about safety. Dave didn't really talk about it. It's pretty incredible. Um, there's two jet skis, and Dave can explain that to you more you know, afterwards um, if you have questions about it. But for those sports, you know, I was talking about how tennis is really like the stand-up version. Um, with tennis, too, you can, um, I forgot to mention, you can play against a stand-up person. It doesn't, you don't need to have a special chair that they can play, stuff so like that. But with water skiing, it feels the freedom of it is almost identical to the stand-up, and same with alpine skiing. Those two are, I always recommend, Better pair to give it a try because it's it's pretty amazing. But, uh, that. Sure. Yeah, one of the things I'll mention with water skiing, the only requirement we have is that you're able to float with a life jacket on and turn from face down in the water to face up in the water. If you can do that, you can water ski with us. Okay, so if you're comfortable in the water with a life jacket on, kind of do that dead man's float, roll onto your back, you're good. Okay. When we, when we water ski, obviously having the, bo the boat pulling, we also have a jet ski that follows. Um, so if you are to fall out there, jet ski comes by, person on the back of the jet ski jumps in, make sure you're all right, gets the equipment, puts it all back together. Um, these skis are very buoyant. Um, and when you have lack of mobility from whatever level down or lack of mobility anywhere, they're really tricky to just sit in the water and balance. So that jet ski, um, what we call their jumper, they're in the water with you. They can help stabilize you until you're ready to go. Boat takes off. They just hold on and release you. 
get you back going again. They climb back on the jet ski and then follow. Okay, so there's always someone around to help. Um, as you progress into the sport, you get more comfortable with the equipment, being in the water with the equipment. Um, a lot of people get to the point where they can do that independently. Um, and there are some tricks to doing that independently, and you know we'll work with people to, to really get them to that level if that's where they want to go. Other people just want to jump in and ski. And we always say that Northeast Passage is a very social organization. Um, a lot of people like that. You know, time in the water, hanging out, you know, oh, that was a great crash, you know, whatever. And, and you know, you're chatting with someone while the boat's spinning around you, you can set it back up in the ski, and off again. So, uh, really cool program. We water ski um, kind of all over New England. We ski every Tuesday night during the summer in Barrington, New Hampshire, and in um, Merrimack, Mass. Um, but we also do weekend clinics that rotate around New England. We're going to be down in the Cape this summer um, with Spalding. Uh, next year we'll probably be in at a New Hampshire lake. We've been in Vermont, um, Rhode Island. We kind of bounce around. So try to give that opportunity um, equal access to everybody. Now we can jump back to winter. Sled hockey, um, very popular winter sport, especially here in the Northeast. Um, it's a sled, similar to the other, like the Nordic ski or something like that, except underneath there are two skate blades. You sit right over those skate blades, and ideally you're balanced over them. So the only point of contact with the sled are on the ice. The front of the sled will actually come off the ice when you're sitting balanced. Um, to propel yourself, you get two sticks. You get to cheat a little bit. Instead of one stick in hockey, you get two in sled hockey. Um, there is a, a curve to the sticks. So when you put them on the ice, you can control the puck with either hand. Okay. They are also your means of propulsion. On the back side are metal picks. They're very sharp. You don't want to stick them into your legs. Um, you, you'll hold the, the sticks up nice and high. You stick them in the ice and push. Because ice has very little friction, you can get going pretty fast on one of these things. Um, they're a lot of fun. There's definitely a learning curve to them, uh, especially when you tip over or you need to stop. It's very tricky to stop. Most people will just go full speed into the boards um, or into somebody else. Um, but really fun. A couple different examples of sleds there, different seats. These bucket seats, really with all of the skiing things, alpine skiing, Nordic skiing, um, water ski and in the sleds. The bucket acts as the boot, okay? So if you were standing up and you put on a pair of ice skates and you didn't tie them tight, how are you gonna skate? Pretty poorly, right? Very little control. If you get in the bucket here and you strap yourself in, make that nice and tight, when you move, it's gonna move, okay? It's gonna be a lot more responsive and once you learn how it all works, you can control it pretty well. Um, so that's why you see a lot of these um, pieces of equipment with buckets on them. Um, they have straps on them as well. Strap yourself in nice and tight. Um, on the sled, your feet go out front. This is a foot guard on the front. And your heels would go here and a strap would go over your heels. If your feet were not secure, um, and they kind of flopping around, your knees were flopping around, it's going to affect the performance of the sled. Um, also adjustable, which is nice. Um, sticks are available in different lengths. Um, you cannot, they cannot exceed 95 centimeters, I believe. After that, they are too long. Plus, they get really hard to control. Um, but rules of sled hockey 
have a, have a maximum length of how long those can be. Um, this red stick here is a goalie stick. Yes, there are goalies in sled hockey, and yes, they do stand in front of that puck. <laughs> um, and if you think of being a goalie in sled hockey, your mobility is pretty limited. So it's a tricky position to play. Um, full gear, full contact. Same as regular hockey. Um, so a lot of people like to play that. Like quad rugby, Chandler, Chandler was talking about earlier, we find a lot of people that just because they now have a spinal cord injury or another disability, they don't want to stop that contact. That's what they love. That's what sport is. So we see people that are like, I just want to hit somebody. You know, get me out on that ice. Let me hit somebody. Come on out. This is the right sport for you. Um, so there are a couple companies that make this stuff. Um, CanWin is based out of Canada, uh, make really nice sleds. Uh, this is a unique invention sled. They're based out of Arizona, believe it or not. Um, we also got a picture here of a, a child with a walker. Um, we have done some different modified stand-up skating as well. Um, one thing I must say, there's nothing commercially available for walkers besides the little walkers that they have for like regular ice skating um, for little kids, little things. But as people get taller, there's not much out there. Um, we've made a bunch out of PVC. Um, they work really well until they hit the boards. Because the ice is cold, PVC gets cold, they hit the ice, uh, they hit the boards, and they disintegrate. So um, that's, uh, that's skating and hockey. There's a per picture of uh, a US um, team member kind of handling the puck there. You can see that he's on an edge. When you on an edge like that, that's how you turn on this. Um, so the, really the trick with the skating is three points of contact. If you have three points of contact on the ice, you're going to stay upright. Okay. So to turn like he is, he's got his left hand on the ice. The right hand is doing the moving. So he's got one hand on the ice, left hand, or right hand is moving. Keeps that three points, three points of contact on the ice. The left blade, the front of the sled, and his left hand. Okay. Okay. Cycling. There is so we could do hours on just cycling. So this is going to be really brief. I apologize. Why don't you slide that one over here, Chandler, and right in front of the table, the upright? Um, hand cycles. Completely arm-powered bikes. Um, there are two different styles, uprights and recumbents. We'll start with uprights, the one on the floor. Can you guys see that on the, in the back? Let's, uh, let's do that one first. We'll, uh, we'll switch these up for a second. Hang on to it just in case. OK, upright bikes. Pros of upright bikes are easy transfers, really maneuverable. Because your feet are positioned behind the front wheel, you can turn that steering as far as you want. Okay. So I could put this bike down here, ride around this room, ride down the hallway, ride onto the elevator, um, ride off the ele back up off the elevator, ride down the hallway, out the building. Piece of cake. Okay? They're that maneuverable. It's a huge bonus with these bikes. So if you're looking for a bike to ride around the block, um, ride with the kids in the neighborhood, I have people that get these when they're pushing long distances in their wheelchair. This is a whole lot easier to push a long distance than a manual chair. So they'll get one of these. They'll go to fairs. They'll go to you know walkways and that go around lakes, things like that. It's a really nice bike for that kind of set, setting. The downside is not a whole lot of performance. Your center of gravity is very high. Okay? So when you get up to speeds, they become very tippy. Okay? Um, 
but if your goal of the bike is for that maneuverability, ease of transfer, around the block kind of thing, this is the way to go, okay? We won't let that one get away. The other style bike is the recumbent. Legs out in front of you. This bike, really the complete opposite of that one. Um, low center of gravity, much more stable. Sorry. Um, however, it's hard to get on and off this thing. About 14 inches off the ground, this one. Uh, the race bikes are between six and eight inches off the ground. Also recumbents. Um, more performance based. So if you're looking to get out there and do five mile rides, 10 mile rides, 30 mile rides, this is a great overall recreational hand cycle. Um, it will give you that performance that you're looking for, um, but it's not, it's not a crazy race bike. Race bikes are, are not the most comfortable things. You know, they're designed to race. You do your 20 miles, your 40 miles, whatever it is, and you get out of it, like the racing wheelchairs. They're not comfortable. You don't want to sit in that thing all day. This one here, it's got a nice reclined seat. You can sit in it all day, go out. We have people that ride these 100, 100 miles, and they'll get on it every day and do it over and over and over. Um, so in the hand cycling world, this is the most popular style. Um, and it will allow that level of performance from beginner level all the way to advanced. Um, the beginner bikes, they make this in a beginner model as well. Basic coast to brake, seven speed. Um, that's how the, the upright bike is set up as well. But this bike here is set up like a mountain bike. 27 speeds. It allows you to, it's set up like a mountain bike. So when you get to those hills, you can climb them. It's got that granny gear. So you put it in the granny gear and you crawl your way up. Your arms aren't developed to power a bike like your legs are. It wasn't designed that way. So by having that granny gear, it turns that bike from a dependent piece of equipment where you get to those hills and you need a boost to a bike that's got gearing low enough for you to get up those hills. Okay. Um, another thing with the bikes, you're usually around cars. They're pretty low, as you can see. A lot of you can't even see these ones here on the ground. Always wear, you always use flags, and we always wear helmets, of course. Um, but the flags put something up at eye level. Okay? A lot of people resist the flags because they don't like, I don't, I don't want people looking at me. Really, it, it's so they can see you, because otherwise, if a car is backing out of a parking spot and you're coming behind them, there's no chance they're going to see you. We don't want anyone to get run over, so we put flags on all our bikes when we send them out. Other bikes. This one here. I'm going to have to hold it on the table because it's so wide. These two bikes weren't enough for people. So they created a mountain bike. This thing's cool. And it's really light, believe it or not. Uh, this is a Lasher um, all-terrain hand cycle. Um, big, gnarly three-inch wheels on it. Um, super low gearing. If you want to go crawl through the woods, this is a great choice. Um, they've raised the seat up on them a little bit, so they've got, you know, eight, ten inches of clearance on them. Um, I have bungee cords on it because otherwise the front end would just kind of flop over um, with the steering there. But once again, all the ha all the controls are on your hands, brakes are out at your fingertips. You can crawl pretty much on any trail that a regular mountain bike would go on. Um, the downside with with these bikes, and the, and the difficulty they have is when you get to a hill and you start climbing them, you generally will lose traction before you run out of arm strength. And the reason is 
the front wheel drive. So off-road, it's really difficult to climb something that's pretty steep. Once you start climbing the hill, all your weight transfers towards the back of the bike. The weight comes off the front, and it will start to slip. But besides that, this is a, a great way to access the woods. Um, not on the hiking trails like you would with the, the hiking wheelchair, but you know, state parks, things like that, where they have tra you know, dirt trails, fire roads, um, things like that around here, like Blue Hills. This thing would be awesome. It would be a great, great piece of equipment to take over there. Um, but I wanted to show you that. Come check this out later. It looks really heavy, but it's super light. But it's also the most, piece, most expensive piece of equipment we have in the office. It's about 7,500 bucks. Um, so a lot of money for, for the customization and the, the quality of it. Bikes range in the $1,800 to tens of thousand dollar range. Cool, what do we got left? Oh, yeah. All right, let's see what we get up. Modifications. Uh, we do have a, another sport that I don't think are in there, but um, yeah, let's talk about golf first. One of the programs we do every week is golf. Not too many modifications with golf. Um, there are adaptive golf carts. Um, there's a couple different types. One of them that we use has a single seat on it, all electric powered. Has a swivel. The swivel seat on it allows you to play from the cart. Okay, so as long as the course is okay with you driving all over their course, which some are, um, and you have to be a strong advocate for you know, providing access and things like that. But if you're not able to walk to your ball or address your ball at a standing position, if this were my cart, you can swivel the seat to the side and play right from a sitting position. You can play with smaller clubs if that's the right distance to the ball. But they also can bend this part of the club. It's called the hosel. Um, and that can put that club at the right position for you to play from a seating position. Okay? We have other people that have some leg mobility, will stand, but they need some support. So they'll lean against one of the carts. Some people can drive a regular cart. They'll use those lean against that cart. The less equipment you need, the better, obviously, the more places you can play. There are also clubs like this that can help with power. If you look at this club, it's super flexible. But if you don't have the arm strength to swing, if you do it in one motion, you can see this club swinging right here. You know, and I'm not swinging it very hard. It gives you a little extra punch, okay? Also from a sitting position, your legs are in the way, right? A lot of people will play one-handed. Okay, so this adds to that strength by play, playing one-handed as well. Um, but kind of neat. Um, there's also a, a, a training glove out there. Um, all golf shops I've ever been to, into have them. Um, one of the biggest thing golfers. I'm not a golfer, so. I'm doing this from what I've learned from coworkers. Um, the death grip, right? Don't squeeze the club to death, right? So they sell a training glove for anyone that has a little Velcro strap on it. And it goes from the palm of the hand to the fingertips. So you grab the club, take that strap, put it across your fingers, and it holds the club for you. Really, you have no hand strength at all. And it teaches you to swing with very little thing. For people with limited hand function, it's awesome. It will help hold the club for you. So with even with limited grip, you could put one of those training gloves on and it will help hold it. It's not an adaptive piece of equipment. They're like $10. You can get one at any golf shop, get you back out there playing. On this club, I don't know if we can get this on video or not, there's a little piece on the end. Um, this is for people that can't reach the ground. You're sitting in your golf cart. You need to tee up your ball. 
you don't want to have to ask someone to do it every time for you. So you can take a T, slide it in this device, stick it in the ground. Then you take your ball, put your ball on, place your ball on the T. Then you grab your super duper yellow, super flexible club, and you drive your ball. To pick your, pick your tee up, it's got little teeth in it, little rubber teeth. You can take that, stick it on the tee, and it will pick up your tee for you. They're not very expensive. I can find out where to get them, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, but something this simple can make golf possible for a lot of people um, to do independently, which is really nice. Other modifications. Um, a big one is cycling with hand ability. If you're not able to hold on to these grips with your hands, you can't ride, right? The, let's see if I can get my shadow there. The top left picture is a picture of what's called C5 hand grips. Basically a glove with an extension on them. On your pedal, you screw in an adapter. You take your hand with the adapter, the, the plug on it, stick it into the adapter, it holds your hand on the pedal. Then you can pedal just using that glove as your grip. The really nice part about those is you don't need any finger function to, to grasp. But also, if you have an itch and you need to release, you crash, you want your hands to come apart, uh, come apart. <laughs> You want your can hands to come off the pedals. Can I rephrase that? Um, you can take your hands out. Itch with your glove, whatever it may be. Adjust your helmet. Plug your hands back in. Okay. And they're called C5 grips because they work really well for C5 quads. Um, there are other grip modifications out there. The second picture there, just a different type of ergonomic grip, a little easier to grasp. Um, Quickie makes a nice, it's a, a V grip that you just slide your hand in for someone with a little bit of hand function. Those work really well for them. They're very simple. Um, and then in the bottom, as recreational therapists, tire tubing, foam, and duct tape. We can get anyone to hold on to hand grips with those things. No, oh, I do have golf. These are the pictures of the golf carts. Um, so this is the one I was telling you about with the, the single swivel seat. This one also has the, um, the one that uh, raises you up as well, so you can be in a more standing position. It has a chest strap on it, a seat belt on it, and strap yourself right into it. This one here on the top is a, a kind of a more specialized, it's made by Autobach. Um, Pretty expensive, I mean, they're, they're all expensive, but this one's really expensive, about 20 grand, I believe. Um, but it can raise you up, you can almost play from a standing position in that one. Um, and they're also green friendly, so as long as the golf course is open to it, you can drive these things through sand traps, onto greens, across tees. We work with Wyndham Country Club up in New Hampshire and they're super, and that's also where we keep our golf carts. So if you ever want to go try it out, you can come with us every Wednesday night during the summer. Um, but the carts are there. All you have to do is call them up and tell them you need one of the accessible golf carts, and they'll sign out a golf cart, one of those golf carts for you, just like anyone else that needs a golf cart. And you can go play on the course. So that's the equipment I brought. Now the big part, funding. All this stuff is expensive. Um, so where can you get it? There are lots of programs out there. You just have to do the work. Um, there are low interest loan programs. Um, I don't know how much lower interest they can go um, as we're kind of at the rock bottom, I believe. But these are a couple of the ones out there. Um, 
massatloan.org is the big one for UMass folk. Um, there are also several grants out there, foundations out there. Um, Athletes Helping Athletes is a great one. They, they get a lot of equipment for people. If you're interested in getting into this and looking at competition, Challenged Athletes Fund is excellent, but they really focus on people looking to compete. They want their name out there. They want to see their stickers out there at races and things like that. Um, there's a couple local foundations, Kate Kimberly Foundation uh, and the Kelly Brush Foundation. Um, Kelly Brush Foundation is based out of Vermont, but they uh, fund people all over New England. Um, and the big one, which a lot of people forget, is local civic organizations. We see a lot of people getting money from Kiwanis, Lions Clubs, um, school groups. It's amazing. Get the word out there. If you don't know anyone that belong to those things, ask around. People know others that are in those groups, and they're willing to do some fundraising for you. If, if it's a, you know, if you're in their community and they want to help you out. So ask. Northeast Passage also rents all of our equipment. We're the only program in the country that we're aware of that does this, um, mostly because of liability. Um, as part of the university, our insurance covers this. So if you want to come try this stuff out, you can come take it from us for the day, for a weekend, um, up to a two-week period. And the, the whole idea for our rental program is one access, because it is expensive. Uh, but really, so if you're interested in getting into cycling, you can come try several of our bikes. Figure out which one works best for you. That way, if you're to put out $3,000 for a bike, you're getting something that you can use. It's not going to be something that sits in your garage and collects dust. dust. So we want you to be educated consumers. Okay? So you can come and try it with us. And the rates are, are very reasonable, especially if you compare them to other stuff out there. If you were to go rent a bike, if I were to go rent a bike, you know, I'm looking at $50, $60 a day to rent a bike. We charge $25 a day. Um, our weekly rental is $75. You're not going to find anything out there to rent for $75 a week. Um, you can also find the stuff from durable medical equipment places. However, they don't like to sell recreation equipment because they don't know anything about it. So come to us. We'll tell you what you want. We'll help you with order forms. We'll point you in the right direction. Make sure you're getting what you're looking for. Um, one of the companies that we work with quite a bit is called BikeOn.com. They're a uh, vendor based out of Rhode Island. Excellent. The owner has a disability himself, um, and he wants to get people out there in equipment. So um, excellent resource. Questions? All right. This is your turn, guys. You have one, right? Who's got a question? Chandler's got one, too. Yeah. I'm interested in the hand cycles, if you don't have equal strength in both hands, can you use one and also do yes. they make one for small people like me? Yes. They, they have junior and adult size bikes um, in several of the different models. And because the cranks work together, if one side is stronger than the other, that's all right. The one thing that would what we'd have to look at is because you also steer with your arms, 
if one side is stronger than the other, you may tend to go down the street in a serpentine motion. Yes. But that's something that we could look at. You can do different crank lengths to kind of adjust for that. We can look at different grips. There are lots of choices. Couple up front here. Hi. If you're a C4, Gary's a C4 and doesn't have arms or legs, uh, certainly the arms enough to pedal a bike. Are there the little buckets that you see the kids in that could possibly attach to my bike that we could do on straightaways and flat? <laughs> there are. Um, there's, a, there's a bike out there called the du Duet. Um, it's a tandem bike. It, on the front of it, it has a seat, two wheels on either side of the seat. It's connected to pretty much a standard upright bike in the back. Um, and sure, you, oh, could, so you, you could get Gary a ride and go around. There are different t types of tandems out there. Um, there's also a hand cycle tandem. Um, that you could put a hand cycle in the front and another recumbent trike foot powered in the back or hand powered in the back um, and link them together and that could be another way of, of doing that. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sure. Hi. How do you get in and if you're water skiing, how do you get in and out of the water? We roll you down the dock and John dump you in. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> We have ramps that go right into the water, um, mm -hmm. and we have a water wheelchair. So we'll transfer you to our chair, because, unless you want to roll your own chair into the water. Uh. We'll you, roll you into ours, or transfer you into ours, roll you down the ramps, which brings you right into the water, and then you can float right out of the chair. Okay. Then what if you uh, fall over in, you know, when you're out in the middle mm -hmm. of the lake? Our jet skis follow. Yeah. So, and we have a jumper on the back of the jet ski. Right. So if you fall, the jumper will jump off the back of the jet ski, help get you set back up again, get the rope, get you going again. Then they'll climb back on the jet ski and then continue to follow you. So if you fall again, they'll do the same thing. I and I, we have very dedicated volunteers and they will jump and jump and jump and jump and jump. <laughs> and they yell at us when people are not falling because all they're doing is riding around the lake and they're getting bored. <laughs> So we tell people to try harder. That usually causes them to fall. <laughs> uh, two comments. One, one is BikeOn that you mentioned, BikeOn.com. Mm -hmm. They tend to have used cycles. They do. Um, that is a terrific resource because you can get them relatively cheaply. But you have to check the website every day. Correct. Because when they get a, a used cycle, it doesn't last very long. Um, I have a recumbent bike, and I wonder if there's a trick to going from the really low level up into my wheelchair, because that's just a devil of a difficult time doing that. Is there like an intermediate thing? You can go from your, the low level to that thing, then to the wheelchair or something? Sometimes it's just positioning of the wheelchair. Typically, when pe some people will transfer onto a bike, they'll come in to, at an angle, at about a 45 degree angle, on the recumbent style bikes. Yeah, getting on the bike's not really the problem. Yep. yep. Yeah, gravity's great, isn't it? Yeah. So, if you transfer on in this position, one of the tricks to getting off of it um, is to get off and put your chair at a 90 degree angle. So, bring your chair straight in to the side of the seat then pivot yourself so you're almost sitting over your footrest. That way you can get one hand on the far side of your cushion. You can get your other hand up to the back of the seat, and it gives you two higher positions to go from that are stable. That works for a lot of people. Doesn't work for everybody. Nothing works, for the, nothing works the same for everyone. Everyone's disability is a little bit different. Um, some people transfer, can get off the ground to their chair, but they can't do it with all the bike around them. So they'll transfer to the ground, then up to their chair. 
Some people need that intermediate step. It's figuring out what that is, whether it's a step stool that's just a little bit higher than um, the seat of the bike, um, uh, a, like a small folding chair, whatever it may be. It, you just got to figure out what you need and keep trying different things. Um, I love when new people come to our events and they see someone else doing what they're struggling with. Because then they go over to them and say, how do you do that? Can you do it again? So, Thank you. I'm going to yeah. try that 90 degree idea. You're welcome to try it tonight if you'd like. <laughs> You want to do it? Little demonstration? Put them on the spot. <laughs> what side? Left or right? Left or right also makes a difference. Some people like to transfer to the left side. Some people like to transfer to the right side. Here, probably do it this way. These, these also have parking brakes on them. Yeah, can you put that on? See how he transferred his butt kind of over to the edge of the seat towards his footrest? If you put your chair at a 90 degree angle like that, you can get that far corner closer. Whereas if it's at a, at a 45 degree angle, you have to reach further across and your arms are more spread out. <laughs> we have some questions from webcasters. Sure. And the first one is, I'd like to know about the portability of the bikes. How do yeah. they break down for transporting them? That's a good question. Get a big vehicle. Um, they, don't, they don't break down very much. Rear wheels come off just like wheelchair wheels. Um, most of them are just push button unless they're a race bike. They're um, usually a screw on axle. Um, that's about all the bikes break down. Um, so they're long and skinny. So if you have a hatchback or SUV, pickup truck, anything like that, no problem. It's when you have a four-door sedan, you know, small two-door car. Believe it or not, a uh, Toyota Prius works really well. Just put the back seats down and slide it right in. But when you take the rear wheels off, you know, it's just this long, narrow kind of thing, and you can usually roll them right into the back of most cars, as long as they have some kind of hatchback or um, something like that. When they have a trunk, it becomes really difficult. There are bike racks that plug into trailer hitch receivers. It's the only kind of bike rack that really works for the hand cycles. So if you have, if you can put a trailer hitch on your car, whether it's a small one or a larger two inch one, um, you can get a bike rack that plugs into those hitch receivers that hold the bikes. And one of our webcasters added that bikeon.com um, has them. Yes. And um, I think that. And we have one at our, uh, at Northeast Passage as well. So if you'd like to rent a bike and try it, um, or need that to transport a rental bike, um, we can set that up on your car as well. And one other question here, do you ship rental equipment out of state? Do, can you ship items packaged for checking for air travel? Um, we do not ship uh, rental equipment. Um, unfortunately, we've had a lot of bad experiences, um, a lot of damaged equipment, um, or equipment comes back to us damaged and we're, we're out. We're a nonprofit organization. We need money to keep ourselves going. And when we get a piece of a, a $3,000 piece of equipment back with 
$500 worth of damage, that kind of hurts us. So we do not ship. However, um, you can ship this equipment. A lot of people will take it traveling with them. Um, do you want to reply to that on how you would take a piece of equipment? There's a microphone right at the table there. From us, a lot of people take it on. We've had, uh, especially the hippo camp goes has been everywhere. Uh, all the islands, it's been to South America. They're Israel. amazing. I mean, that hippo camp is. I've used it a few times, but it is absolutely. If you're a water person and beach person, and you want to get back out there, and the chairs with stopping you, get into that thing. Don't be afraid or ashamed. Someone push you or a little help. I mean, you're on the beach, so you know, suck it up. Um, but when you're traveling with those things. Especially when you're flying, uh, when I used to road race and with my tennis chair, I take it with me all the way to the gate. Never gate check it. Okay, this is a piece of your equipment. You tell them everything about being in a chair is. Uh, I'm sorry, never uh, baggage check it. Always gate check it and make sure they put a gate check tag on it. We're our own self advocates. We're not advocating for ourselves. We have to advocate for our equipment because when you show up somewhere and your equipment is not there or your chair is not there, you are out and all of a sudden you're in a hospital wheelchair and you don't have your hippo camp. Take it with you. Watch them put it on the plane. I will literally take it all the way down. I will see the guys in the nice shiny vest put it on to the plane. Um, sometimes you go, but always gate check it. Take it down with you. They will tell you not to. They will tell you, oh no, it's fine. Never listen to them, gate check, everything. For those people that use power chairs and have never traveled before on planes and stuff like that, call these airlines. Talk to them through it. They are actually, I mean, some people do not like airlines. I think they're amazing. They've been doing this well, well before ADA. And if you talk them through it, talk about your battery, talk about how you want your chair, what's the best way to pick it up. If you don't know how to pick up your power chair, Talk to the manufacturer. They will show you points on it to pick it up, how to detach certain things. But always stay with your equipment, either a power chair, your, your racing chair, your hippo camp, your chair. I gate check everything. I bring it all down to the gate. And they will fight you on it, but you, it's your rights, and you can do it. So I always gate check it. Everything else besides air travel, train travel, and stuff like that, um, it's pretty much the same principle. Um, in Boston, things like that. But if you are flying, gate check everything. Yeah, I, I mean, we can do a travel program right now if you want. I was going to go into it. I've done a lot of traveling. Uh, yeah, take your cushion and your back cushion with you um, because if your chair doesn't make it, you're going to need your cushions, um, especially obviously for quadruples and, and um, with transferring and with uh, pressure releases. You want your equipment and you want your. Uh, your, your seats. I always take it off. They always want you to sit on something like that. I don't. I put them in the um, overhang. You're always the first one on. You have plenty of space to put it on. Um, you're the last one off, but whatever. Read your book. Um, but yeah, we, I can talk about plane travel all day. Well, yeah, if you're flying up, yeah, it's cold. 30,000 feet. Yeah, you're right. Gel. I don't have gel, so it didn't, never froze on me. But. Anyone else? Okay. No? Great. Thank, Thank you, you both so much. This was terrific. You're very welcome. Thank you.